Uh, thank you very much for having stayed that long. It's definitely the better choice. Uh, you would be just stuck in traffic. So now you're stuck with me uh, and we are enjoying process chemistry. So we talked so much about uh, the plant genetics, um, the chemo profiles of the cannabis, and uh, then the cancer effects, anti-cancer effects, and other medical effects. But uh, I'm the lonely chemist, no, well, one of the few chemists up here, uh, and I just wanted to point out it's not as easy to just say hey, if OG Kush works, that's the one that treats your indication. Uh, and um, to make this point that there is a little bit more to the whole production pipeline than just like strain and then you're good with a medical outcome, uh, I just want to say, show what all happens during these steps. Um, for that, I bastardized one of the discnomics um, uh, graphical pr representations because uh, up here I devised this kind of uh, visualization, and uh, here in the middle, the middle circle um, shows us which cannabinoids are present. Uh, so the blue ones are THC, the red ones are CBD. Um, so this shows the ratio, and the diameter of that circle is how much there is, the total concentration, and the same counts for the terpenes. Just point a, uh, point a few out. And it's not important to really remember which cannabinoid is which color and which terpene is which color. It's just important to just understand the basics like ratio and the diameter is your concentration. Um, I will also not concentrate on cultivation or formulation because they are not my fields of expertise and uh, we talked about that enough uh, over the last few days. Um, so we do see different strains, different cultivars, offer different chemical profiles. On the cannabinoid side, not so much, because there, as it was pointed out in a recent paper, there is actually not much difference. Thanks to being able to test for THC, all cultivars in California are now high THC. Uh, if that was the greatest idea, we are not really sure, but there is still a large variation in the terpene profiles. And uh, as you can see, you have different dominant uh, terpenes, uh, here's the yellow, that's limonene, then that's, um, that's myrcene, and here the uh, orange one is beta-carophyllene. Uh, but you also see them in different concentrations. Um, so, and that there is a difference in the terpene profiles we saw in the talk yesterday by, about this, uh, this omics, and uh, there's also a very nice paper that talks about the chemical chemovars by Fischer Dick. Um, but again, my focus is on what happens between you grow it and then you actually give it to your patient. And I just wanted to point out, it might be obvious, uh, but some people might forget about this too, is the way you dry your plant actually controls how much terpenes there is. So you don't have much effect on the cannabinoids itself, but if you do the fast dry, like, hey, I dry it in four days and then I go on, you lose most of your terpenes. Uh, and you have to control the conditions in your uh, drying room to really control what is left on the plant in the terpene, uh, on the terpene side. Uh, and we can take that further, uh, depending on which atmosphere you store the cannabinoid, or the, the cannabis itself, you again, you affect um, the concentrations, the amounts of terpenes, the concentrations of cannabinoids, uh, and even the ratio of terpenes. So if you look at this here, this is blue, yellow, gray, green, um, which is the same here, but if you change the gases, now we have instead the gray, we have a blue in here, um, and I really can't remember which terpenes they were, but the point is we are changing the terpene profile. So that is good and bad. For one, if you wanted something to be stable, don't change your gases, but if you want to be more in an artisan approach uh, to, to really modulate the flavor or the terpene profile, you can do this. You can also use all these aspects to compensate for any variance that might come out from the grow. Maybe your lights were off for a day or you had a hail day. Well, probably then it's all dead. But if it rained, for example, too much. So, and this is just in the drying and uh, curing aspect of the cannabis plant. Uh, then 
my main field of research has been on the extraction side. So if we just pick one of the, uh, of the cured strains and we take them along, uh, pro tip, if you want to extract, don't cure, it's just a waste of time. Uh, but for the extraction part, it even makes a difference how you mill. Uh, different milling methods will give you different extracts if you keep everything else the same. And uh, I want to point out the food blender here um, because you can't just say, oh, I mill it and then we are good uh, compared to whole flan because at two millimeters we get this basically best yield out. Uh, and if you do a food blender, which gives you a very imprecise, varied particle size, it will be all over the place. And um, if you care about efficiencies, that's definitely not the way to go. And then in the extraction itself, and here I just uh, show that for supercritical CO2 extraction, you can really modulate what you extract. I can pick out just the terpenes, I can pick out just the neutrocannabinoids, so THC here, or I can extract a THC acid, so the acid form, and have that one relatively purified or enriched. So you can't even go like, oh, you took sour kush and extracted it with uh, CO2, you still don't know what you actually got out. And you can't go from one vendor to the next. Uh, they probably don't use the same methods. So you can play with that. Um, but as, a, as an extractor myself, I can now still use that to play and modulate. So what does the doctor want? What does the patient need? Um, what variants did I get out of the grow? What do I need to buffer? And the same I can actually do with uh, CBD versus THC extraction, um, they do have different solubilities uh, in CO2, so I can now play with that ratio. Uh, we know from all these chemovar studies that uh, this cannabis cultivars mostly extract exclusive th uh, express, mostly THC, mostly CBD, or a one-to-one -one mixture in the middle. But if you want a three-to-one from a cultivar, you can do that if you play with your extraction conditions. Um, and for the hemp people, if you need to suppress your THC amount, uh, there is a method, uh, there's a way doing that in the extractor and not having to deal with it afterwards. So, okay, now we're done, right? Unfortunately not, because uh, normally you post-process, or most people will post-process the material. And uh, the general thing that is done is decarboxylation. And uh, I've seen it in person far too often. You go in an extraction room and they have like these two liter, five liter beakers on a hot plate and it's just bubbling away. And so I ask them, so how long does that go? And they're like, yeah, two, three hours. Um, not really that precise. Um, so we did some research on like process uh, analytics to actually track that in real time, how it decarboxylates. But one of the big takeaways was if you do decarboxylation under air, you have oxygen, you have heat. There's a lot of stuff that's going on. And in my case here, when you do it under air, yeah, you get your THC decarboxylated, but you also get delta A THC, there's a CBN, and then there's a plethora of stuff that you don't know. Like, there are currently no analytical methods that can tell you what it is. Well, it made the people high, it looks clear, so we're good, but um, so far we don't even know. So I would recommend doing that in a, under an inert atmosphere, so here exemplified by CO2. There's no oxygen presence, so you don't get all these wild uh, side reactions. And talking about side reactions, that is still possible in your distillation apparatus. If you're good in distilling, you kill these few percentage of THCA and maybe some other minor cannabinoids and get rid of all the flavor and you have like really nice, clear, pure THC, which we just saw in the talk before isn't maybe not the thing you should use anyway. Um, but if you don't really know how to extract and you just think clear is king, uh, you get all these other things that are currently still unidentified, but at least they make you high. So, so it just boggles my mind as a, as a chemist. Like they don't know what they're doing and like most people don't seem to really care. Um, but we really need to, to think about this processing step also on a very specific and organized method. Um, and I said we, I'm not talking about formulation. I just want to do one case study. Uh, we have a 
patients, so most, all of this research was done at Outco in San Diego. It's a fully vertically integrated dispensary. So we do see patients. And uh, we had a patient in his mid-30s, and he had about eight seizures a day. And the mother was uh, at the end of uh, her uh, hope, everything else, the classical medications didn't work. So she comes to us and wasn't sure that she really wants to do it. It's tea, cannabis, it's weird. And at some point she's like, okay, we try it. So she takes, buys this uh, CBD THC tincture with a one to three ratio, um, 40 milligrams per milliliter, no terpenes because I do remove them mainly for flavor aspects out of my extract first, and then MCT oil, so medium chain tri triglycerides from uh, coconut oil distillate. And the patient basically went seizure free for weeks. And we're like, yay. So then the mother comes back and buys the nice next bottle when it's empty, and it's the same bottle, the three to one oil, and the seizures restart immediately. And like she's freaking out, then the dispensary freaking out, and this was um, earlier this year, so I had seen Professor Dini Mary's talk last year uh, at Harvard, and I was like, yes, I was waiting for this case, because we changed Chemovar, because we ran out of Diamond OG, so we used Lemonade Haze, but we formulated it exactly to the same concentrations. And the patient seizes again. So we scrap together all the leftover diamond OG, give that to the patient, and the patient is seizure free again. So now I'm sitting there and I was like, that's awesome. Uh, and I have until Christmas, because then we are out. Uh, so I look at this, and okay, so CBD, THC is exactly the same. My formulation scientist actually can do his job and weighs the materials correctly. Uh, we look at the acid forms of the cannabinoids, and they are kind of the same. Um, we even look down our list of tested molecules. There is CBN present, CBG present, THCV present, and you, you can't really say there is a difference. And, and then at CBG and CBC, we do see a present or absence. But thanks to the talks we saw beforehand, that might still not be the right answer, but that's where my analytics end. I right now have no access to further analytics, and I'm definitely not going to fractionate my oils and going to try that on the one patient if it works or doesn't. I'm not going to do that, like 20 different oils. Let's see what works. Uh, but it just, we are, we are here at this conference and we're all really happy, and yes, cannabis works, it's great, um, but it might not be as easy. We, we should consider all the steps in between, and they might be hard, and they might be boring. Like, I'm a chemist, like, that kills the party normally. But, <laughs> but now when I tell them what I do, I own this party. <laughs> but, I'm like, do you bring samples? I was like, yeah. <laughs> so, we, we shouldn't get ahead of ourselves, like, yeah, cancer cures everything. Uh, cannabis cures everything. What well, cancer does, you're dead and don't care. But, so, okay, cannabis cures everything. Like, don't, don't, let's not do it that easy. We still have to have a long way ahead of ourselves. And uh, I was uh, talking to a formulation scientist recently, and she's like, yeah, we are about in the 1930s with the progress that's currently there. Like, we have a few decades to catch up to the other industries. So I have to thank everyone I worked with. So I worked or work at Outco for now, um, the dispensary in San Diego that does all the work uh, and gives me all the material. And these optimization studies where you saw the few discs, um, that's about 10 kilos or 20 pounds of weed per disc just to get the data points. So that's a lot of stuff, but um, it makes it money back afterwards. And so then the other companies we worked with is Nate for the controls in the drying room, Henkelman was for the gases and the curing, Fritsch is the milling study, Apex is all the extraction work, Perkin Alma was uh, the work we did for process analytics, and uh, we did make it to the end. Um, what I want to point out is I'm getting kind of frustrated with like these things we currently do and don't do yet and can't do. Three so minutes. therefore, 
I wanted to mention that earlier, you don't actually have to take pictures of it because I'll upload everything on SlideShare. And otherwise, if you have any questions or want to do any collaborations, please find me there. Um, there are votes next month. I can't, I'm German, I'm heading to Canada, and I do some work there, so please find me there. Thank you. We have time for a couple questions, if you'd like. Hi, just to clarify, with those two preparations, were you fortifying with isolated compounds to reach those equal three to one levels? We fortified with uh, CBD isolate, yes. Uh, we only grow THC strains, so we used isolated CBD. And are you aware if the patient has had a chance to try CBG or CBGA? Uh, I have no access to that purified, so I can't uh, offer that. Great, thank you. Any more questions? Thank you very much. Round of applause, Dr. Mar Marcus Rogan.